You're listening to C-Suite Success Radio with your host and executive coach, Sharon Smith. If corporate success is your goal, C-Suite Success Radio offers you informative interviews with experts that will help you shorten your learning curve and accelerate your momentum to higher achievement. C-Suite Success Radio makes it simple and easy for you to tap into the wisdom of other successful business people who know the path you're traveling. If you're ready for success in corporate America, welcome to your new home at C-Suite Success Radio. And now, time for your host and C-Suite Executive Coach, Sharon Smith. Welcome to this week's episode of C-Suite Success Radio. I am your host, Sharon Smith of C-Suite Results. Each week we focus on success, a word we all know and something we strive towards, but not a word that's easy to define. All of our topics and guests are aimed to help you achieve the goals you've set for your organization and for yourself as a leader, but more importantly, to help you accelerate the pace of your success. On today's show, we have Amjad Safarini, founder and CEO of CyberVista, a Graham holding company, formerly known as the Washington Post Company. CyberVista uses learning and behavioral science to transform how large company boards and executives govern and manage cybersecurity in their organizations. In addition to these literacy programs and tools, CyberVista's training division prepares cyber practitioners through security certification prep and continuing education. Prior to CyberVista, Amjad was president at Kaplan, Graham Holdings Education and Training Unit, in charge of the university's innovation group. Amjad lives in New York City area with his wife and three children. Let's listen to the conversation I had with Amjad and learn how he defines success and the lessons he has learned to help you gain the edge you're looking for. I am very excited to have Amjad on the phone with us today. Welcome to the call. Hey, Sharon. Thanks for having me. Yeah. How is life for you today? Life is great. We are in Washington, D.C. I call it Washington, even though we're technically in Roslyn. We have a fantastic, fantastic view of I'm literally looking out over the river and the National Airport and the Capitol and the White House and every monument in D.C. So I feel blessed that we have this incredible view over here that we definitely don't have in New York where I live. I do love the D.C. skyline. It's very, it reminds me of where I am and how just a cool city it is. I love it. You know what? I was just pondering that. I was saying, we, you know, I work, I'm so lucky. I work one mile away from sort of like the, the epicenter of the free world, I guess is one way to call it that. And I live like within 10 miles of the financial epicenter of the of the world. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, given given all the boisterous talk about North Korea this and North Korea that. But, you know, for now, I'll take it and enjoy it. Absolutely. May as well enjoy it while you have it. Well, we're going to start by having you tell us more about what your focus is right now, about Cyber Vista and anything you want to share about your professional professional goals and focus right now. Sure, happy to. We're, we're excited to talk a little bit about um, about Cyber Vista, but also about how the company came about and some lessons lessons learned that hopefully can help uh, your listeners along the way. I love that. Um, That's great. Yeah, so Cyber Vista uh, is a cybersecurity company. We're interesting in the sense that we're a startup, uh, but we are actually part of a not very startup y company. We're part of a public company. And so we're held by Graham Holdings, which is the organization people, everybody would know formally as the Washington Post. So uh, the history is we sold the Washington Post to Jeff Bezos uh, a few years back. And so we have to change the name. We couldn't still call ourselves the Washington Post when we didn't actually own the newspaper. We changed the name from the Washington Post company to Graham Holdings. And Catherine Graham and Don Graham have, uh, have run the company for a very long time. And so now uh, the company, aside from the newspaper, which it doesn't have anymore, runs media properties. We have TV stations runs a very large education presence. In fact, its its biggest group is Kaplan, which is a very large education company in the space most of uh, your listeners would have heard of, and uh, and then does work with industry and healthcare and some of other really interesting verticals. So cybersecurity was a new thing to Graham Holdings, but education is not. And as we were thinking in the education world about new economy skills and about what the next 100 years of the world will look like, we felt that cybersecurity was going to be one of those things that was going to be around for a little while. It wasn't a fad in any sense. We decided to launch a separate offering um, outside of Kaplan that drew on a lot of the capabilities and skills and people that Kaplan had to offer. 
bring that out into a startup environment that could move really fast and sort of fail fast and succeed fast and incubate that as an independent startup. Um, so that's sort of the history and structure of the company as it may. As far as what we do, Cyber Vista, we take on that mission from Kaplan, which is helping students achieve their uh, educational goals and their, their actually their life goals in, in many ways. Uh, and we build on that by incubating into that the elements of cybersecurity as a new industry, right? It's not medicine, it's not law, it's not finance, it's not some of these traditional fields and disciplines that many of your listeners might be a part of, that others are certainly familiar with. Cyber is new. It hasn't been around for even 30 years, really. And as part of that mission, we're excited because it's not just sort of developing people in the field, but it's developing the entire discipline itself, giving it structure, giving it rigor, professionalizing it, if you were to put condense it into one word. Um, so we're excited about that mission for the company of professionalizing the industry, of helping people along the way, and building enterprises with great talent. And that sums up our, our, uh, our company in a nutshell. That's great. Do you find that most of your students are coming to you younger and they're coming into this field new? Or are these professionals who have been in IT or some other field for a while and have decided, wow, cyber is a place for me. There's a lot of jobs out there. There's a definite shortage, a huge shortage in how many people are available and how many jobs are out there. Who are your typical students? So our typical students are folks who have been in, in industry, in security, in fact, um, for a few years, not for sort of decades, but typically three to five years. And they're looking to I keep using the term professionalize, but maybe they're looking to codify is a better word, okay. a lot of their learning. And one of the ways in which they codify that learning is by taking certification exams. They sort of say, hey, I know some things. I'd like the world to know that I know these things. So what is the best proxy for that but a certification. It's a valid assessment. We started the company by taking a lot of that DNA from the Kaplan world and in, in our ability to help students with uh, their certifications, their licensures in these other fields like medicine and law and all these other great fields. And that DNA helped us launch a business around certifications in cybersecurity. And so while we don't actually administer the certifications, those are nonprofit associations who do, we prepare students for them. And you'd think of one of the biggest certifications in the industry is the CISSP, for example. There is the CISM. So there are a lot of sort of an acronym soup of about 80 different certifications. And we're underway on preparing students for many, many, many of those certifications along the way. Because of that, we tend to get an audience who is in security, but relatively new to the field. Within, I would say, three to five years is the typical audience. Now, we are moving in a direction that helps net add new people into cyber. We're looking to bring people into the field. We're looking to uh, breathe new life into it in many ways so that we can help that shortage. As we think of our new programs, we are thinking about how do you take people from IT, from even uh, adjacent areas like the intelligence community, or from people um, in, in far far fields like psychology, for example, and, and get them interested in the field, but not only interested, also trained up in order to fill some of those jobs. And it's an extremely hot market, an unbelievable place. If you're an employee in, in technology and you're sort of even a little bit bored and you're having some self-efficacy issues around what you might want to do with your life, my God, is cyber a great option for you? Um, not because you're bored, but because this may be a very interesting thing. Yeah, I fell into it in 2005. And of course, in 2005, we didn't call it cyber. We called it information security or information technology, you know, IT security. And I came from an audit background. And I took that audit background and started doing information security consulting around some of the compliance initiatives that had popped up in 2005, like Sarbanes-Oxley. And from there, it just grew from learning on the job and continuing and continuing and continuing. In the last few years, this term cyber is really what everyone is using now. It's hard for me to not call it InfoSec or information security, but I realize that the term is cyber and it makes perfect sense. And there's a lot of, a lot of fun and a lot of interesting work. I will definitely testify to that to anybody who's interested in exploring the cyber career field. You don't have to have a technical background. I had, I, like I said, I had an accounting degree and <laughs> audit background and ended up in the field. So there's a lot of, a lot of great crossovers. It's wonderful to hear. When you think about it, it, from your own personal journey, right, it's hard to think about it as something that can happen in outside of serendipity, right, outside of chance, but it really needs to. 
in order for us to fill the shortage in cybersecurity, the estimates are somewhere around a million mm -hmm. uh, people by 2022. Uh, the need will be a million workers in cybersecurity. To put that in perspective, that's more than all the graduates that graduate out of college in a given year. So even if everybody had decided to get into cybersecurity <laughs> coming out of college, all of a sudden major in it, it still wouldn't fill the, wouldn't fill the shortage. We have to think through these alternate uh, opportunities, and, and yours is a perfect case. How do you go out there to, for example, the 5 million IT professionals out there and say, if you're interested, we have bridge programs that can help you bridge from the general IT uh, field into these uh, more IT security fields. And I think one of the misnomers you know well about is that cybersecurity is always about IT. Oh, right. Uh, that was <laughs> Something I actually thought when I came into the field, I thought, well, it's, you know, computer hackers and like the TV shows. And it turned out to be not really that at all. A lot of it is about governance. A lot of it is about, uh, like you said, controls and IT audit. And, and frankly, so much of it is about threats and vulnerabilities and the intelligence around those things. And a lot of it is sort of uh, an old science, criminal justice sense. Absolutely. I like to say that security is not an IT problem. It's a people problem. And until we can help put the right people in those roles who are really empowered to do the job in a way that it needs to be done and not just always waiting for permission or not having the budget they need. I could go on and on about some of the challenges that cyber executives and professionals have. And you did a great talk recently on the topic of the CEO versus the CISO. And it was a really great talk. And maybe that's a conversation for another day. But I'm always talking about how it's not about IT when it comes to security. It's really about people. It really is. It really is. It's a fun. That was a fun. I remember that conversation. It was a fun conversation. It was. And the CISO for for your listeners, that's the chief information security officer. Thank you. And well, here's the cool thing about this role. Most people would not have heard of it. Like if I tell you I'm a CEO, you would know exactly what that is. If I tell you I'm a CFO, most people would know what that is. If I tell you I'm a CMO, you know, people would say that's probably marketing. But if I tell you I'm a CISO, like most people out there, like tell your family that they may not know what that is. And, and that's sort of a, a function of the fact that the role is fairly new. Um, the concept of information security at, in the executive suite is relatively new. And because of that, the kinds of ca characters that are cast into those roles are not really prepared for their executive presence. It's often folks who have graduated through the IT organization, ultimately through the IT security organization, and now find themselves sitting around the boardroom table, either talking to the board or spending their days with the C-suite. And as you know, when you're spending your time in the C-suite, your job is not IT security. Your job is to be a leader in the company, first and foremost. And, and there's a lot of training needed around that. So it was a lot of fun to get some of these leaders kind of uh, built up a little bit. And, and it was only an hour conversation, but hopefully we can spend a lot more time with them. Uh, thinking about how to become leaders in their companies as opposed to information security professionals who happen to have the biggest title in the company. And what was the most interesting for me in that conversation was your viewpoint as the CEO, because as a security professional myself, I get it. I'm like, well, this wh I understand what the security executive is trying to do or what their what their goal is. And I've always been stumbled or questioned, why is it so hard for the CEO to understand the importance of this? So for me, being a security professional in that room, hearing your your take as the CEO, not the security guy, your take was really, really interesting. And I want to take that um, idea and ask you more about how do you go from being the president in an educational organization like you were at Kaplan to the CEO of a cyber training company when you, when you didn't come from security? What what is that like for you to, to take that journey? Uh, in one word, a challenge. <laughs> it was a challenge, <laughs> but it was a well-accepted one. As I mentioned in my first comment, it was interesting in that at Kaplan, we were always looking to innovate and think through what the industry might be doing, not just you know in the next three or five or 10 years, but what might it be doing in the next 50 years? Uh, Kaplan is nearing on its 100th year educating people. And so it certainly needed to continue to think ahead if it was gonna survive uh, into the future. And we were doing that and we realized that we were doing a great job with those standard disciplines. I come from one of those standard disciplines. I took the doctor path to becoming a doctor and. But my real interest always wasn't so much in becoming a doctor as much as it was in solving bigger, more systemic problems. While I never practiced medicine, 
I always had my hand in it as an educator for Kaplan at the time running the medical side of the house. And so that was something that uh, really drove me at the, it, dur throughout my career at Kaplan, first within medicine and then beyond that to most of the education Kaplan was doing. And ultimately, as we started looking outside of those walls of the traditional disciplines, we started to see that there was that opportunity in these new economy skills. We, in fact, called them new economy skills training. And it factored in things like cybersecurity and data science and even to an extent coding and, and the more sort of hard technology fields. And we felt that we could do more in them. And so it was part of my project and part of the work I did to, to do the work on the on that investigation. And when I finished it, it was uh, it was Don Graham at the time who had sort of I remember we sat down for our breakfast uh, one year and 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 he said, well, this is great. I want it to be outside of Kaplan. I really think that that this could be more than a, simply an educational offering, if that's a simple thing. More than an educational offering, you could do a lot more. But also, I want you to be able to run fast on this because there is an opportunity right now in the field, not just from a business perspective, but to really make a difference. And how often do you get to say that you're able to make a difference in the evolution of a new discipline? We're, we're having a lot of fun with, with taking on that challenge. The short answer is I got into it because it was a huge challenge. Did I know anything about security? Not really. I mean, my background is actually in cognitive science. So there was a little bit of, of that in there, uh, a little bit of machine learning from biomedical engineering. So I had some taste for it, but I certainly was not an expert in it when I got in, involved in it. Um, but that should be a testament to anyone else interested in getting into the field. Absolutely. And I remember you telling me when he mentioned to you that you were going to be the CEO, you were like, no, no, that's, that's not my role here. Yeah, that's right. And it wasn't so much because I didn't think I could I could do a CEO role. It right. was a great honor, of course, to, to be a CEO in a Graham Holdings company. But, but beyond that, I sort of said, I think you really need um, expertise to be driving this company forward. And it was one of those sort of life lessons that you learn along the way that, you know, that he sort of said, like, expertise comes in many flavors, right? And, and just because you're a cyber professional doesn't mean you're the expert that the field needs. And, and maybe the expertise you have, for example, in helping professionalize medicine, that expertise could really apply into the cyber field. Um, and you can make a big difference in that. So I appreciated that vote of confidence. And it really helped, uh, helped, helped me certainly make up my mind to, to move into the role. I like what you just said. Expertise comes in many flavors. That's a really great, great saying. I just jotted it down. What was the hardest part with starting Cyber Vista from the perspective of not having that cyber background? What did you have to learn? I guess the one blessing you can have if you're about to get into something brand new is if your background is in education, because, you know, by definition, you kind of know what you don't know. And you, you probably have a pretty good idea of how you need to acquire that information. I spent a lot of time doing both formal and informal learning. I would spend a lot of time speaking with experts in the field. I would spend a lot of time speaking with folks who needed a lot of the talent that we were talking about building the GAP programs for. And then I spent a lot of time at conferences and in informal trainings, actual classes. So I took classes uh, to get my A plus certification, which is one of the certifications in the field, more IT related, but it was sort of the first stepping stone we expect our own students to go through. So I said, well, I might as well be the guy doing that. And so, you know, went through that and got my certification, learned how to swap hard drives and computers. <laughs> the journey, I think, was tumultuous, not in the sense that I didn't know what to do, but I was really surprised by the lack of resources available to others who may be in my shoes who don't actually have a learning background, right? And folks who might be interested in getting into cybersecurity, who may be even coming from a very relevant adjacent field, maybe like from intelligence, right? They're coming out of one of the agencies in government. And they're saying, hey, the cyber stuff is really interesting. How can I best use my talents in the field? I'm not sure that we as an industry and as a discipline have answered that question in a good way where we've provided the guidance and support and then the mentorship and uh, you know all of those kinds of services that could actually help that individual get into the field. That's a great point. We were talking recently at the conference you and I were at. It's the ISC Squared Annual Security Congress. And one of the one of the sessions at lunch, they were talking about the gap, the shortage of, of security professionals. And people were talking about how they see these job descriptions and they want 
these, these employers want all this expertise for entry-level positions. And so I see what you're saying. We're having a hard time allowing people to make the jump and get into the role and mentor them through and teach them through and help them get to that place where they can have the job because everyone seems to want someone who's already experienced. And we know that we need another million people. We need to bring people in who don't have that experience. So how do they do that? It's a really interesting point that you brought up. That's right. And uh, I don't know if you, you remember those commercials. There, there were these commercials where, where it was like, you know, I don't want to be a blank when I grow up, right? Or, or I want to be a blank when I grow up. And it was, it was a little bit of a funny take on, on middle management jobs, I think, or something like that. And the, well, the point behind it is you don't really have kids growing up saying, I want to be a cyber professional, right? And I think the, the discipline does have a little bit of a marketing problem and a thought leadership problem. And Though we individually can't solve for that, we can definitely be a little bit more proactive about bringing together the different entities who can collectively solve that, whether it's the different entities who are the different associations, and we're trying to work with all of them right now. The different entities could be the big thought leaders in business, for example, around this issue, um, or it could be the places where you least expect it, uh, for example, like the working with, uh, with many of the large nonprofits that could help drive a lot of that vision in young kids in the K-12 education system. Uh, so these are things that will help 20 and 30 years from now, and we're trying to do that to help the discipline. At the same time, we're trying to solve the shorter-term problem with a lot of our programs that we offer in the commercial space. So, you know, right now, how do we fill the gap? Well, we train people for it. And, and that's sort of how we're trying to tackle the issue from both sides. This is a really interesting conversation from that perspective. I want to shift gears a little bit because when we first started talking, you mentioned lessons learned, failing fast, succeeding fast from a startup perspective. So let's switch gears a little bit and not so much talk about cyber, but talk about startup and lessons learned. Well, you, you want me to list all of them? We're going to need to hold <laughs> more than an hour. <laughs> no, I definitely, I definitely think we need to keep it, you know, to a, to a minimum. But for anyone listening, who is either in a startup, thinking about a startup, or maybe even looking to take an established company and put in a new business offering that might feel like a startup, what are some of the biggest or the top maybe three to five things that you really have to think about or lessons learned or things that you failed fast on and if you had known differently before or you were listening to someone provide this kind of guidance, you could have been like, okay, I can do that and avoid that pitfall and get get to the next step faster. Sure. Yeah. I think I think um, one of the biggest things that I had learned in uh, coming over from an executive role in a large company, 25,000 plus people, to an executive role in a startup, and you know we were one, and then two, and then three people, and and so on, and we've grown since then. Was was that there is a crispness and a purity to the role that you have as an executive in a startup that really doesn't exist. Even if you try to have that crispness in a big company, it, it doesn't really exist, and it's almost backwards. You would think that in a big company everybody has a defined role, and in a startup you kind of have to do everything, and that's true tactically. But from a strategic sense, you have because you're so limited in what you have in terms of resources, even if you have all the money in the world, you certainly don't have all the people in the world. But you have to really condense everything you do in a, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis and beyond to to very to very sort of tactical and, and ultimately mission driven goals. So, for example, for me as the CEO, those goals come down to what every startup leader would tell you, hopefully would tell you, which is that in your company, you ought to be thinking about what that vision is. But then more importantly, you better be promulgating that vision out to your people. On a daily basis, they need to remember why they're doing this. Oftentimes, because there isn't a product, there isn't a customer yet, you're a startup. And so you're building all these things on, um, on hopefully some good basic science but also, frankly, you're taking a big risk. And so that vision becomes really, really important from the perspective of the CEO. The second part I would say is that as you think about getting the right people on the bus, and that is your job as a CEO, especially early on, to get the right people on the bus, one of the things you have to continuously be thinking about is, are they occupying the right seats on that bus? And, and I use the term seats because I think typically people will occupy multiple seats, right, in a startup <laughs> We all wear different hats, even though um, we may have, you know, functional roles. And and I think that one of my surprises was that that tends to change as the company evolves. And it could change week to week. It could change month to month. 
certainly it changes year to year in terms of what the roles of those individuals are. You may have brought somebody in to head up a particular function, maybe operations or something like that. And you find that, you know what, not only do they have a knack for a particular area, but they prefer to be in a particular area, product development, for example. That is something as a CEO you really need to be mindful of. And I would say the third, sort of facetiously, I would say, make sure you don't run out of money. Uh, <laughs> and that's, uh, that's a lot easier said than done. Of course, uh, fundraising is the first step involved in that and making sure the company is funded. But then it really tracks back to, are you aligning your expenses and the controls you have around your expense management around the goals that you have for revenue and the, you know, sometimes the risk associated with the revenue not coming in. And as a leader, uh, it ultimately falls on your head to make sure that that P&L is properly balanced and also fits in line with the fundraising goals that you've, you know, made out to your other stakeholders like your investors. Those are great. The first two you mentioned are ones that I speak about often, and I know you you did not get to hear my presentation at the con- at the conference. I apologize. That's we, okay. We, I we listened wanted, to yours. We didn't want no. to interrupt your presentation, <laughs> so we left the room. I understand. Mine came right after yours. But it's funny that while you didn't see mine, the two, first two things you talked about were in my presentation, vision being one of those areas that as a leader, if your folks don't know why they're doing what they're doing, it's very easy for them to move on or go elsewhere because who wants to just be a cog in a wheel? Everyone, I believe, wants to be doing something for a reason and they need to know what that reason is. And it makes a lot of sense that in a startup, you might even need that more than in an established company. But oftentimes you find yourself in a position or a job where you're doing a job and you don't know where it really fits into the big picture or the vision or the long-term strategy. And it's really easy to lose sight of why you're doing something if you don't have that reminder on a regular basis. I do like to talk about that from a leadership perspective. It's a leader's responsibility to keep that vision alive for everybody on the bus, really. And speaking of the bus... The other thing I talk about is I talk about the right players. I kind of use sports as an analogy when you talk about football. Not everybody gets to be a kicker or a lineman or a quarterback because that would be a weird game if everybody was and it wouldn't go very well and it wouldn't be football. And you have to make sure you have the right players in the right positions. And so it's the same idea of having the right seat on the bus. And so I love that you brought those two up because I fully agree with them myself, and we hadn't previously discussed that. In some ways, it's easier in football because you know that you have to fill a quarterback slot or a running back slot or whatever it may be, and 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 nobody really tells you what the roles are in a startup that you need on day one and on day 100 and on day 10,000. Um, That's a good point. So it, it's a sort of like a multivariate problem in that sense. Now you have to figure out what the roles are and find the right people to sit in them. That's interesting, and that's a really good point that from a startup, especially from a startup perspective, you don't even know which positions you need, let alone how to fill them or who to fill right. them with. That's right. Uh, you know, it's funny. There, there's a... Uh, there's this concept uh, I was having recently um, breakfast with one of our advisors uh, who sits on our advisory board, and he, he reminded me of this thing I had heard before, and it was around this concept you talk about of sort of leadership versus management, and, you know, really that leadership is sort of on the more on the vision side, whereas management is really the two and three we talked about, getting the right people on the bus and also managing the money side of it. And, and he had articulated it really well. And I asked him, well, where did you get it from? And he shared it with me, said uh, leadership is really more of an art, whereas management is more of a science. And I looked it up, actually, right after he had said that. And it came from this British military leader. His name is uh, Marshall William Smith. And, and this guy basically said, leadership is all about personality and vision. And that's where the art part comes from. And management is really just a matter of calculation and statistics and methods and routine. And that's what makes it a science. He kind of closed out with managers are necessary and leaders are essential. The really interesting thing about all this is that that sounds kind of, you know, kind of obvious at this point. But that was a guy talking about it in 1957. That's when he said those things. It's kind of interesting that a lot of the lessons we use today were, are actually nothing more than rehashes of things that are, you know, 60 plus years old. Absolutely. Some of the best, greatest minds go back to like Napoleon Hill and, you know, things that we've learned from a leadership perspective a long, long time ago and has just been reiterated in different ways by different people along the way to keep teaching more and more people and the next generation and all of that. But from a new idea perspective, yeah, there's probably not that many new ideas. It's a matter of taking old ideas and rehashing, I don't want to say rehashing them, but making them um, better, making them um, innovative, innovating. Let's say that innovating old ideas into something new. Yeah, I think I think that's 
I don't know if I want to agree with you on that. That like I think you're you're definitely on to something. I would say that maybe a slight retweak of that is that sometimes the old ideas were ahead of their time and it's time to bring them now, you know, time to bring them back. And, you know, I'm thinking back to like the Apple Newton and, you know, and the, the huge failure that was. And, it, you know, just the rehash of it became the iPhone and iPad. Ultimately, I think there is an opportunity to say, what does the market need? But as we were talking about earlier, there's also an opportunity to take a thought leadership position. And I think that's a broad statement beyond just cybersecurity. If you find that there is a thought leadership gap in the space, in other words, it's not really well codified or understood what you ought to be doing as a company or where the ball might be moving forward, then it is incumbent on you. I would say it's not just an opportunity, but it is incumbent on you as somebody in that discipline to take that leadership position. And create in some ways that disruptive innovation in the space. If there's no thought leadership, there's probably, it, the space is probably ripe for disruptive innovation in that sense, um, in the Clayton Christensen sense I, I'm mentioning here. So I think that's the kind of thing that attracted me to cybersecurity and to CyberVista in particular, is that that disruptive innovation in a thought leadership vacuum creates enormous value to the industry, to the discipline, to our shareholders, uh, and to us personally, I think the the corollary to that is that if you're in a leadership position in in uh, sort of just in a sustaining innovations, and I say just, it's a very difficult thing to sustain innovation, but it gives you little advantage. You know, there's very little value growth associated with sustaining innovation versus, of course, being in disruptive innovation, and it comes with a requisite risk, and that's why startups are high risk, high reward. I think the big lesson is don't be a middle manager like from those commercials. <laughs> Thought leadership is needed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, before I run out of time with you today, I must ask you, because that is one of our goals in this show, is to have you tell us your definition of success or how you've defined it for your, for yourself over the years. And we know that definition of success can change depending on what part of life we're in or what we've done or where we're going. It can be your current definition of success. It could be one that you've used in the past that maybe isn't exactly what you're using today, but worked for you at a time that you needed that definition. But share with us how you look at success. Well, I, I suppose I read this book. It was my first year of college. And I read this book called The Selfish Gene. I don't know if you've, you've read it. It's by Richard Dawkins. No. Um, it was literally the first book I read in college, and it was published before, you know, before even before I went to college. It was, I think, in the mid-'70s that it was published. But it was all about sort of propagation of, uh, of, propagation of the gene of a species. Um, and as the title suggests, the idea of the selfish gene is that someone is always going to act in the best interest of their genetic propagation. And and I think there's a version of that in terms of how I define success. And, and I say that in the sense that I don't do everything in my life to propagate my genes. But I think the, the, the notion is that when you think about propagating your gene and, the, and surviving, it's kind of pushing through, you can literally draw a line, a matrix. And one side of it would be sort of your person, personal side and what we would call our sort of personal life, family life, the other side of it might be what you would consider work, but maybe maybe even more broadly, society. And so I would say if you if you draw that and put in each column, personal and society, and then on the rows, put something like picking the right goals and achieving those goals. You kind of create a two by two matrix. And I think you can probably define success pretty clearly in that two by two matrix. And, and it would align really well with that concept of the selfish gene, the idea that on the personal side, I want to do as much as possible for my family, so I have to pick the right goals, and then I have to achieve those goals, and that would be success. And then on the societal front, I want to make sure that even if my kids ultimately become well-formed adults, that they're also not living in a malfunctioning society, and so I have to kind of do everything I can to enhance the environment. And that's where the bigger systemic problems we talked about earlier come into play, and success means picking the right goals in terms of improving on society and 
hopefully achieving those goals. Too I like esoteric it. Or? No, of course not. No, I like that. It's about choosing the right goals, which means that has to be the right goal for you as an individual instead of a particular goal. It's not about you need to make this kind of money or have this kind of job or do this thing. It's about figuring out what is that goal for you and for your family and for the society that you want to live in and you want your kids to live in. And it's not um, it's not written in stone for anybody. I, I think so. I think so. I, I mean, I think I think almost every decision I've made can probably fall into one of those four buckets. It's either about picking the goals personally or, or in general for my for my work and society in general and all my stakeholders, or it's all about achieving those goals. No, oh, I appreciate you sharing that with us. That's a great piece of, whether it's advice for someone else or just a great piece of information, I think it's really helpful to hear. And I love to hear how people define success because it can be done differently for different people and there's no right or wrong. And I think that's the point of it is to understand what it means for you and to follow that and to implement that for yourself. And as life changes, so does our definition and what that means. And it's okay to change. If we're young and we're just going after some career goal or financial goal and at some point in life we realize, wow, there's more to it, there's this other thing, there's the family side or whatever that looks like, the definition of success can change. It's fluid. And I think, yeah, it it falls really nicely into the earlier uh, topic we were talking about with it applies perfectly for companies too. Um, You know, companies, I think, in relation get organized to, to, to really kind of satisfy their customers' needs and sometimes that exact organization is what ultimately becomes their downfall. And so it's uh, the same goal setting exercise and goal achieving exercise, um, I think works for companies as well as it does for persons and individuals. I think it's really interesting because we've we've seen so many large companies that were doing so well go out of business because someone else innovated. We've seen, you know, Blockbuster's gone, um, Bed Bath & Beyond is still around, but Linens and Thing is gone, Borders, one of the biggest bookstores, gone, and lots. Uh, the taxi system has got to be struggling because of Uber and Lyft, and all of these things, all you know, Amazon and the, the ride sharing and all of these other ways to get a similar service, if not almost the same service, is because someone out there saw a way to do things differently while these other companies didn't change their definition of success or didn't stop for a minute to say what's happening, that how can we fill this need differently? And I think it's a great reminder, and I like that you brought it up from a business perspective, that businesses also have to look at what are they defining, what are their goals, and I'm going to add to what you said, are those goals still applicable and relevant? Yeah, that's right. You know, it, if, if you're if you're a blockbuster, you know, convenience sometimes means bringing the DVD to the customer rather than opening up more brick and mortar stores. And blockbuster, the horse blinders, of course. In retrospect, it's easy to talk about those, but it was all about the com- the company and the competencies within the company. Really, became all around real estate development. Right? It became about how how can we open up more stores so that we're more convenient to the customer. And ultimately, failed to to see the shift in trends. Um, so I think if there was a goal setting exercise there, it certainly didn't didn't hit the mark. Um, and that lesson learned can be applied to almost every industry and almost every company. Yeah, and I think for me, the question would be for organizations like don't know the answer is, do they have a goal setting exercise? Do they really sit down on some kind of annual basis or maybe even more frequently depending on the type of industry and say, okay, what are the current goals that we have? Are they still applicable to the industry? And how can we look at this different? Who else is you know innovating? Are we innovating? I don't know how often organizations actually have that exercise. You know, and it often comes from the from the trenches and the front lines and the best ideas, I mean. And I think there's an opportunity in every company. If you're not hearing from the front line and from the trenches, and by hearing, I mean literally hearing. And one of the things that, that, that I often did, especially in the bigger companies that I've worked in, is um, and something I learned from one of my previous bosses, was to do a uh, birthday call every week with the individuals in the company whose birthday it was during that week. So we did that with, um, you know, an organization of a few thousand people. And so you'd end up with a call every week that had, you know, a dozen or so people. Um, and and here you are, you know, you're one of the leaders in the company. You're talking to anyone in the company who's at that level. And you can get their ideas. You could throw things out at them. Um, and you really get an appreciation and a perspective. And why that's so important, I think, is, is really, again, I have sort of this big issue with middle management. Um, the issue I have with middle management is that, their incentives are built for them to avoid risk. 
And so because they're trying to avoid risk, often the best ideas don't even make their way to the top. They actually actively work to block them. Um, and so, uh, and sometimes they, don't, they just don't back them by not applying resources to them. Maybe they're not blocking them, but they're just not excited about them. And so how do you get through that? Well, one is, of course, change the culture of the company so that it rewards uh, it rewards the kind of behavior that allows us to experiment and, and learn and, and, uh, and ultimately innovate. But the second thing is you've got to be able to create those channels and those opportunities for people who see the light on the, in the trenches and, and on the front lines to communicate those ideas all the way to the leadership. That's great. I love the birthday call. I think that's a fantastic idea. Anyone listening who likes that, I think, start to implement it. That's a great idea. And it's, you know, it's going to be value, valued by the people on the call because they're getting, they're getting a happy birthday from the leaders taking their time and they want to hear from these individuals. I think it's fantastic. Lots of fun. It's an example of uh, kind of leading by example. This has been so much fun. Thank you so much for joining us. We are really out of time, but you have provided so much really great information. I will make sure that our listeners have access to your like LinkedIn page and the Cyber Vista website. If anyone has questions, they'll know how to reach out to you or anything else you want to share, make sure I have that information and we'll get it listed with this show once it goes live. And I really appreciate you coming on today. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to learn more ourselves. I'm always uh, looking for those learning opportunities. So thank you for having me on and uh, allowing me to share a little bit of our story. Most definitely. Looking forward to talking with you again soon. Sounds good. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thanks for listening today. Tune in for our next episode. And in the meantime, you can get more resources at www.c-suiteresults.com. Make it a successful day.